Hello and uh, welcome to a new episode of The Geek Recipe. Uh, today we're going to cook a traditional iconic Italian dessert, the tiramisu. And our guest today is Frederick Schreiber, uh, CEO of Three Realms. And he's going to tell us a bit more about his secret recipe for good entertainment. Frederick, welcome. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Welcome to our kitchen. Hey, good to uh, see you. Good to see you. Uh, we had a chat earlier on and one of the things that uh, we wanted to start with before we just lay out what the secret, the ingredients here are, was this idea of putting together the right people to make good games. And I'd like to start from that because that was very interesting, a, a nice hook to start our conversation with. So how do you do this? How do you select uh, a team for making a good game? Well, so, so generally when we, when we find people to work on, on the games that we develop under Slipgate and, and publish under 3D Realms, we, uh, we focus more on just generally great people, not so much people who have a, a profession within a certain category of game development. The most important thing is that you have a genuine heart and you're actually a good person to work with. Because if you're not, it doesn't matter if you're the biggest talent in the world, if you can't collaborate with others, it's gonna fail, ultimately. So, so that's our starting point, finding generally great people. The second part is that we want to make sure we have people who are extremely passionate about the project that we're looking to hire them for. Games like Core Decay, which, uh, which we're watching right here, for instance. This was a game that was dreamed up by one visionary, um, but he didn't have the, the team to actually make yeah. this vision come true. So, so here we're looking for, for people who share the same dream, passion and vision for a game like Core Decay who we can put together with the, the visionary, Ivar Hill, uh, and help him develop this game and turn it into a great product. All right, yeah, this is, this is great because it's a bit like kitchen, right? You you're have all your ingredients and you have to find the, the, the right ingredient to make your recipe work. Uh, so today we're doing a tiramisu. It's going to be like very simple. Uh, there's debates on who invented tiramisu in Italy. Of course, like every, every like traditional dish. Uh, we're gonna say it started in north of Italy, just to, not to annoy anyone. Uh, so we've got uh, the, the coffee, the chocolate. Uh, we're gonna prepare some espresso coffee, mascarpone cheese, eggs, sugar, and these are Savoyardi biscuits. Uh, that's, they are very specific for the tiramisu recipe. Now, first thing, I'd like you to, uh, if you can, do some coffee for us. Absolutely. So do one, one mug of coffee and I'll do the eggs in the meantime. I'm doing five eggs here. Fantastic. So Frederick, uh, how is it uh, that you, you started in a weird way? You were very young in the, in the industry and one of the things that really struck me was I started and you didn't really have a clue about you know, how to make a business and, and so on. And fast forward now, you're a CEO of a big company with how many games are you developing now? Uh, so we, uh, under three realms, we have around 14 games. Wow, that's uh, a lot. That, that is in, in current production, and many of them are we develop, we're developing under the, uh, the Slipgate Ironworks. Program. All right, okay. How did you transition from being like, okay, I've got to focus on one thing, this is the only thing I'm doing, to now I've got 14 games. And we, we're a bit the same, right? We've got so much stuff in development, we can't even keep up. Yeah. And uh, because you, you have to shift your creative focus, right? You know, you become almost like a manager and don't really look at uh, the creative part of it. So how did you transition from one to the other? Well, so, so the transition was actually really hard for me. When I started, it was uh, with, with the dream of creating a certain type of game that I felt were missing in the industry. Generally, the types of games that 3D Realms, id Software, Raven, Rogue Entertainment, the, these companies made back in the 90s. I was at the helm of most of these games until a certain point. In a certain okay. point, you, you grow so big that, that you have to, to kind of give that responsibility to, to someone else. Right now, we're over 200 people at the wow. studio. So what, uh, what was really hard for me was to give that responsibility to someone else. But again, it comes back to this thing about, about finding right people. If you find great passion, people who share the passion and vision that you have, and you dare to give that responsibility away, you see your games flourish in a completely different way. And a good example is Cultic, which was recently released. You know, if, if this was uh, five years ago, I'd been right next to Jason throughout the entire development of yeah, this game, yeah, yeah. making sure that everything goes exactly as it should. But with Cultic, sure, we were very involved with the creative process, making sure that everything works uh, and adheres to the vision that Jason has. But otherwise, I was mostly hands-off with the game itself. I gave a little bit of feedback here and there, but I trusted that his vision would turn into fruition with this game. 
and it did. It did, yeah. And it's a hard, it's hard, hard thing to do because all of a sudden you turn into a manager. But I try and turn it around and say instead of me having to be a visionary of each of our games, it's more of the vision of the general philosophy of the studio. So making sure that we create a, 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 and foster these great talents who can then turn out to be individual visionaries, we build the teams around them and we make sure they flourish and can create the games of their dreams. All right, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a really, really fun process. By the way, you say it's a fun process and how do you keep fun in this thing? Because one of the things we see a lot is that if you're not having fun in your process, yeah. you're not making fun for the people, which is really interesting because most of the jobs are like, crying work yeah. it's like you know I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do this and i have to achieve this and like success files and stuff but our industry is more like we make fun for for people to enjoy and in the process it's almost like becomes a job but yeah you don't want it to be a job you want to have fun with it it Otherwise, takes the fun out of it when you get to a certain point in development yes also called the development hell which everyone experiences <laughs> through, throughout development but but it, it's a really good point it's very closely related to our mantra so Slipgate Ironworks is our development studio, right? That's where we take care of all of development. And our mantra is that we only work on the games we want to play ourselves. And that essentially means that the games that we do at Slipgate are games that we want to play. Uh, and we're in a fortunate enough position that we can make those types of games. We don't have to take orders from anyone else. We don't have to take outside clients and make games for them. We're only making the games that we're fans of. Someone has a dream and a vision. We make sure everyone else, hey, do you have this dream and vision as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's, let's make this. And, and being under the embrace of family as we are right now gives us additional freedom to do that. And that's, that's fantastic. So on Comtic, what I was uh, interested to know was, uh, you know, you started saying it was, uh, this was a game made by one guy. Yeah. Right? And is the whole thing made by one guy? The whole thing is made by one guy. And it's actually... Kind of a unique case. You know, usually we don't do that. Usually when we find someone who's extremely talented, like Jason and like Ivar Hill and, and many of the others, we try and figure out how can we make their dream game? How can we help them make their dream game? And it's usually about establishing the right team. In this specific case, Jason wanted to try to make everything himself. He wanted to learn how to make music, how to make art, how to program, how to do everything, animation, etc. And He's like, all right, let, let's go ahead and do it. So that's what we did. And you know, you can say it limits kind of the scope of a certain type of game you can do. Of but, course. but Jason took a lot of very, very smart decisions while making this. One of the parts was that he decided to go for graphical style, which he could master. Meaning yeah. that within the graphical style of Cultic, he could make it look really, really good. But did he have to make anything like, you know, AAA quality or, or a beautiful, the hand-painted pixel art and so on. He probably wouldn't be good enough, but for this art style, it was perfect. The same goes for the music and so on. So he decided to make choices that would make the game look like the best possible version of itself and feel like the best possible version of itself by just being this one person. Incredible. Do you think this played a, a, some role in the success of the game at all? Or, or was it not like... I, I, I think it, it plays a big role in the quality of the game uh, to some degree. Because when you have all game development, which turns into a problematic development cycle, is usually because there's a conflict between the visionary and then the development team. And at some point you have to, you have to cut your resources, you have to cut your costs, and you have to, to cut features in order to actually make, like, finish the game. Right? So the finalized product might not be exactly what the visionary yeah, 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 yeah. hoped for it to be. In this case, there are no, none of these problems. There are no other people to deal with. <laughs> yeah, of course. You essentially make whatever you, you like to make. Of course, you can say this might turn into an endless development cycle, never be done. Yeah. How but long did it take to do it? Coltic took just a couple of years. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. And he did, he did a great job. And he decided to split it into chapters and say, all right, I'm, I'm going to finish what I originally envisioned for the actual gameplay and great. make like a, a, a little bit of content around it, enough content to justify, you know, a, a, a full product. And if that turns out great, I'm going to take that base formula and make the second chapter. And it turned out fantastic. Well, how many games have 99% positive reviews on Steam? Yeah, it, it's, it's, <laughs> exactly. I was actually looking at it this morning because, you know, you've got like, the top ranked games. Yeah. But it's not listed yet. I don't know why. 
but it's gonna be like up in the top 20 most best rated games ever. Alongside Iron Fury. Alongside which, Iron which, Fury. Which is fantastic. And, and I think this proves, hopefully, that the philosophy we have at 3D Realms about taking individual visionaries and making sure that they're completely free to make their dream game. It can be one person making his or her own game by, by all by himself, or it can be this person with a full team that we establish and, and help this person. That, that, that's the goal, essentially free the visionary from the handcuffs of, oh, I also need a, a, a job my, right my, next to game development, I don't have enough funding, how do I find the right people, etc. We, we wanna make sure that this person can just create the dream project. And that is what 3D Realms has allowed us to do. Of course, we're staying within this hardcore sphere of, of games. We don't wanna go and stray too much away from that and create you know, puzzle games, adventure games, and so on. We're staying within what we are known for. We wanna be the experts within that. And we have, you know, we have two fantastic games uh, out now, Iron Fury, Cultic, they're both you know, 90, I think 95 plus. Yeah, it's incredible. We have a few more coming, hopefully we can also reach that with those. And then of course we have an RTS, which is a completely different discussion. Yeah. So let's move to the second part of the yes. recipe. All right, so this, these are done. I give myself an 85% review here. I'm not ah, super satisfied, but it's, perfect. but it's okay. This is the most terrifying uh, moment when you prepare tiramisu. And my kids make fun of me when I do this. So. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna put all this together and finish the cream, which is, uh, I would have people insulting me because I do this uh, all together. <laughs> but in every recipe, I try to annoy someone. So in, um, I usually either crack the spaghettis or do something that really annoys the purists. Put oil is, in the water uh, and all, all well, the... All maybe, the that, maybe not that. All but. the ter <laughs> terrible tricks that people have been made to believe are good. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of these jokes in uh, Italian uh, cuisine because we are, you know, we are purists, right? So, you know, the, the typical one is, do you put pineapple on a pizza? Yes. You know, stuff like that. Of course you uh, do. Of course you do. Of course it's, you it's do. good. And and ham, ham and pineapple. That's really good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, don't say that to many people. I, I have this discussion. <laughs> the office. I always order pineapple pizzas. Then I get to keep them all for myself. <laughs> what is the the traditional dessert in Denmark? Yeah, the traditional dessert. That that's a tough one. Does it include fish? No, I think I think it's um it's a dish which is essentially just a broken dish which uh, it's called uh, it's called grand marsh broken broken dish essentially it's it's essentially you take apple pie you put it in a in a glass like a cup transparent glass spoon of apple pie it can be a, okay. like a day old or so you know okay. leftover apple pie down there ah, okay and then you take some uh, some whipped cream you put it down there and then you take some crumble uh, bread crumbs okay. but it has to be like the sugary coated bread crumbs you put that in there you mix it all together Top it with a little bit, and then you eat it with a spoon. Okay. It's like that's, a decon. It it, it's like it's like a deconstructed apple pie okay, in yeah, some yeah. weird way. Sense, yeah, yeah. Um, what's, it, what's it called? I think it's called uh, in English like grandma's. No, no, it's eat in Danish. It best most able cake, something like okay, that. Okay, okay. So but but it, th that's that's a dish that I remember as a kid because apparently it was really easy for your parents to make. Okay. Your grandparents, of course. And of course. everyone loves it. Okay, now the cream is done. Mm -hmm. What we'll do is we'll start preparing the biscuits, the Savoyardi biscuits. This is important for, uh, I, this is the second time I say it, but it's because I, I care about it. Not any biscuit. Uh, and uh, so what we'll do is we'll put, and hopefully we won't do anything wrong because it's up there. But, uh, put the cup in here. And, uh, here just, just like turning like, them like once. This. No, like this. Yeah, just on one side. Just on one side. Yeah. There we go. So uh, you hinted about Tempest Rising, yeah. and I want to know more about it now. Uh, there was uh, an article on uh, PC Gamer recently that uh, the RTSs are coming back. Does it have to do with that, or was it just before you realized that RTSs were coming back? It, it, it has to do with that. Uh, okay. I'm sorry to say. So going back to our, our philosophy about you know we we want to empower our visionaries. Usually that's within the genre of games that we were known for. RTS is not what we're known for at all. This is one of the games that uh, I always had a dream of making. I grew up playing Command and Conquer, I grew up playing Starcraft, Warcraft, these classic RTS, like yeah. the foundation of that genre. And I felt something was missing for almost a decade, since Starcraft 2, okay. something like that. 
extremely high fidelity from a big studio, great story, cutscenes, and that classic RTS feel. Nothing has really come out since StarCraft II, which is a decade ago. So even though it's not a hardcore uh, uh, first-person shooter, it's, uh, it's something that, that I was really passionate about. So it actually started as a side project, uh, my own little right. pet project on the side, uh, trying to build a team around this. And today it's probably one of the biggest productions we have. We're almost 100 people working on the, wow, on, on the team. Yeah, I've been working on it for uh, a little over two years by now. And uh, we have a great partner in THQ. Uh, they, they joined uh, after the vertical slice. But yeah, the, you can say the, the attitude of the game is still very much Slipgate in 3D Realms extremely gory, hardcore action. Okay. It's just from a different perspective. And the type of strategy game it is, is also much more similar to, to what you remember from back in, in the Red Alert and, and in Tiberian Sundays. Extremely fast paced, extremely violent, um, but with an, an awesome like sci-fi lore behind it, still rooted in reality. Uh, we're not trying to make something that is a, uh, a spiritual success or anything like that. We're still building uh, our own universe with Tempest Rising, but we want to make sure you get that warm, fuzzy feeling when you play the game, just as when you play Iron Fury, and you're thinking back to Duke Nukem, Shadow Warrior, those types of games. Uh, hopefully you'll get the same feeling when you are playing this in, in comparison to, uh, you know, to games you grew up with, like Red Alert, Dune 2, yeah, Starcraft, yeah, yeah. Warcraft, etc. What, what are the things that, uh, yeah, you say it's, because of the article, but I think it's going back to this thing that you make games that you want to play, right? It, it does yes. go back to that. And uh, the point is that when you want to make a, a game that you want to play, but there's a hundred people involved, then does it make it still the game you want to play? Does it turn into some, a game that somebody else wants to play? That's, uh, that's the question. Yes. Uh, this team right here was made up by people who are extremely passionate about the RTS genre. So it was kind of done in reverse. So usually we have someone who's passionate about the genre. We, we, we build a team around that person. Yes. In this case, I was passionate about RTS, but I'm not an expert in RTS games. You guys are, are know a lot about RTS games. You have people who grew up and played these games continuously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the hardcore games. I knew there were people out there who knew more about RTS than I did. So in this case, I had to find the co-missionary. I had a vision for, I wanted a game that okay. gave me that warm, fuzzy feeling I, I had as a kid, but I need to find an expert. So here I found my partner for this project, which was a Wayward Strategy, Brandon, uh, who was actually a guy who, who yeah, wrote, yeah. he had a website called Wayward Strategy. Yeah, he's where an he, is, uh, Yeah, he, he, he does deep dive analysis of the RTS genre. So I asked him, hey, I have this vision. It feels like you also want to make a game like this. Do you want to join us? And he did. So uh, Brandon is the uh, the lead game designer on the project. I'm the game director. And then most of the team have worked on RTS games before. Most of the teams are hardcore Warhammer 40k fans, hardcore RTS fans in general, Command and Conquer fans. We even involved a lot of the RTS uh, community behind Command and Conquer Remastered Collection. Sounds like my usual day in the office then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, we, yeah, you guys have all the Warhammer stuff as well. Like we, uh, every, every last Friday of the month, the whole team gathers up. They usually play Warhammer on uh, have this big desk. They set up everything. So this team was built by Wargaming fans. You should and do a game together, Fred. Absolutely, absolutely. My Necrons will uh, will destroy you <laughs> in, in a second. <laughs> but I'm up for that, for sure. But yeah, that was important. And it's the same thing with all the games we have development. The, the, the teams need to be passionate about the games they're working on. We never hire people who are coming in, do a job, get out again. Yeah, yeah. We need people who are passionate, part of the family. That's also why we have such a flat structure uh, at, at the company. So yeah, with the RTS genre, it's a, it's a new genre, but I think and hope we have something great. Uh, we think it's great. You know, every time we play the game internally, you almost can't stop playing it, especially me, because I miss the game like this. Uh, it looks exactly what I envisioned a That's game great. like this would keep look. Keep that vision uh, ex ex exactly alive. That's so uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun and it's uh, it's also a big challenge because you know you've got to manage a big team, so it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, so we've we're sort of I think we've almost composed it all. We just missed the chocolate. Yes. And uh, do we have uh, anything to put the chocolate on, or is it going to be with the? Thank you, Enzo. Thanks, God. Always, always <laughs> uh, great help. You helped me with the carbonara by saying there was no pepper in it. Now he's helping with this. 
that's why that's why we're having some. All right, so do you want to do it or do you, should I do it? I can do it. Yes, go for it. Yeah, sure. All right, yeah. So basically, uh, the, the, the secret here is that this should be done after the tiramisu has been in the fridge for at least at least a couple of hours. Yeah. But uh, of course, we don't have a couple of hours. I mean, we'll, we'll have a couple of hours late, but we, we need to finish this. So you're doing this now. And the other thing is some people put some sweet wine or, or such in the tiramisu, but because I do it for the kids, of course, I can't do that. So this is a, a kids friendly version of a tiramisu. There we go. That's fantastic. Here we go, guys. Do we think we did a good, did a good job? Let's taste it first and okay. then we'll we see. It, it. it looks good it and that, look that's good. the best thing good. for the camera. Okay. They can't taste through the camera, <laughs> so we'll just pretend it tastes well, amazing course, as well. well. Of course. One, one thing that uh, you, you said before, before we started was that uh, a lot of people who work with you have to know a lot of different things, have to know how to do a lot of different things. We, you're the you're the salty person in the house, or are you doing the sweets ones? You, you're you're doing the dessert, right? I am the sweet, but I'm making the salty food. Yeah. Okay, so you have to you have to know both, right? <laughs> so this is more like a science, exactly. right? Right. The salty one is more like creative <laughs> yeah. stuff and so on. So how do you cope with that in the, in the studio? You have a lot of people, and they have to know a little bit of everything. This is something that in a the industry that you know has a lot of specializations. Mm. It's almost like your identity right you've got like a single guy doing an entire game and then you've got all of this how, how does it transpire into the games into the company's soul part of the reason that our mantra is <clears throat> that we uh, only work on the games we'd like to play ourselves is that we we want to make sure the people we hire uh, of course they have a speciality you know you might be an artist or an animator or a designer or whatever but but you also need to wear multiple hats and you need to wear multiple hats to understand how the the entire game works but also in order for you and the rest of the team to be flexible and agile when required. Usually in software development, uh, you, you and, and that's essentially what game development is, it's, it's just a piece of software, software uh, when we break it all down. You put people into boxes, say, okay, you do this specific thing and you do that until the yeah. game is done. You do this specific thing. The problem there is that when you start getting tunnel vision because you're sitting only doing the same thing over and over again, you, you lose, we feel that you lose the passion and the vision of the full game. So we try and find people who have a core speciality, but can do a little bit of, of things surrounding that. So in the case that you are done with your, let, let's give a good example of, of an, an animator, right? Yeah, you, you get the character, uh, you're about to animate it. The rig is not done. What do you do? Traditionally, it's like, all right, the rigger needs to rig it and send it to me. What I do meanwhile, I sit around and wait. Here, we, we need to find people who take action, who essentially say, you know what, I'm gonna try and rig it myself. Rig it myself, finish it up. If it's good, it's good. And you save the rigger some time. Maybe the rigger was helping someone else out with something else. Uh, when, the, when the rig is done it, and, and, and all animated, it goes uh, to be implemented into the game, right? All right, so, so you have maybe an, an AI programmer or a technical artist or some, something like yeah. that who takes the, the, the character in game, make sure it all works. You create animation blueprints, all these things. But if that person is not available uh, until, you know, in a week from now, hey, I'm gonna try it out myself. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but if it doesn't, it's still available for the other person to do later. Yeah, yeah. If it does work, I save that person a lot of time. So this way of thinking, you're, you're not taking someone else's job, but you're making sure that you're helping wherever you can help. Like every now and then I go in and I help with some lighting or I do a trailer or I do some marketing materials or I do a little bit of level design and I only do it because I see, okay, there's a little, there's a little hole here missing yeah, yeah, yeah. and I can see that, that the rest of the people don't have time for this just yet, but it would be great to have it done. So I get to scratch that itch of actually getting my hands dirty with the game. In the I learned something in the meantime and, and that's something we encourage everyone to do. We have uh, programmers who became sound designers because they were passionate about sound design. They're like, hey, I wanna, I wanna try that too. Sure, go ahead and try it. We'll have our other sound designers help you out. That if that's, that's something you want to do in the future, then that's what that's you can good. do. So we have a lot of people who are doing many things, but also changing their, their jobs throughout this process. We have meetings where they sit down and say, hey, I was hired as a programmer. I'd love to be a sound engineer. 
All right, let's see if we can find a game that needs another sound engineer. And then there might be someone else who might be a level designer who got a little bit into programming who can then take over. Yeah, yeah. So in this way, we make sure that you're never stuck in the same thing. You never get this tunnel vision and you get to within reason, of course, to do what you're passionate about. And that passion changes often as you learn more and more about cool. game development and you work on many different types of games. Where's your little spoon? We're sitting on our hands here. Yes. So let's find a new specialization. Test tasting tiramisu. Let's see if we if we did a good job or not. That was a big one. It's not bad, is it? Mmm. Do we give ourselves a nine out of ten? No, this is really good. This is a <laughs> this is a nine out of ten. I'm just gonna try one more. This is a. You gotta, you gotta take some back home, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're gonna make it home and then send us over a picture when you're when you're done. I'll, I'll, I'll do that for sure. That's great. Well, mm -hmm. uh, thank you guys for uh, joining us in the, this episode of uh, The Geek Recipe. Thank you, Fred, for joining us. Uh, you've got a tiramisu to bring back home. And uh, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.